for a Senate Bill 846, which honors his service to our country and to this great institution. I urge my colleagues to join me in supporting this legislation, and I reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman reserves, the gentleman from California. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I wish to yield three minutes to the gentlewoman from Missouri, Ms. Hartzell. Uh, the gentlelady is recognized for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Chairman, for bringing this bill forward. I'm so excited to be here today and so proud to support Senate Bill 846, which renames the uh, new federal courthouse in my district at Jefferson City, uh, the Christopher S. Bond United States Courthouse. This is such a fitting tribute to a great Missourian who have I have had the privilege of knowing and working with over the years. Senator Bond was first elected in 1986 the U.S. Senate and served over 24 years representing our state here valiantly in the United States Congress. And before he came here to the Senate, he served two terms as governor and was also a state auditor. And he's known for accomplishing many things, and there's not enough time to share all of them. But one thing he's certainly noted for is that he started the Parents as Teacher program and took it statewide. And that has be uh, benefited thousands of children in Missouri and across this country, and certainly I participated with our daughter. Uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful program. He's also a great supporter of uh, free trade. Uh, he is, had been a champion of building highways and infrastructure, which has enabled vital investments in our roads and bridges in Missouri. He was vice chairman of the select, uh, Senate Select Intelligence Committee, and he worked for bipartisanship support to renew the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. He's a strong defender of our military and our national defense. And as, being, uh, as part of the Defense Appropriations Subcommittee, he worked to continue operation of Boeing's F-15 production line in a plant next to the St. Louis airport. And we always heard about how proud he was of his son's service in the military. But being from the farm, I appreciated uh, Senator Bond's support of agriculture. And he was certainly a leader in making Missouri a leader in agriculture research. He is a leader whose service has improved the lives of thousands of Missourians, an example of patriotism that has inspired future leaders to follow in his footsteps. Every time now that Missourians will drive by this courthouse, they'll be inspired to serve their fellow man, service above self, just like Kit Bond has done all of these years. And I want to close with some words that Kit said himself about his service, and I think is an example for all of us in Missouri and across this country. He said, serving Missouri has been my life's work. I have walked the land, fished its rivers, and been humbled by the honesty and hard work of our people. The highest honor is to receive and safeguard the public trust. Thank you very much, and I yield back the balance of my time. General Lady yields back. The gentleman from Illinois. Mr. Speaker, I'd ask the uh, subcommittee chairman if he has other speakers. Uh, no other speakers. Uh, if uh, you have no other speakers, uh, we yield back the balance of our time. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from California. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. The question is, will the House suspend the rules and pass Senate H A four, I mean, 846 those in favor say aye. Those opposed? And the, the yeas and nays. In the opinion of the chair, two-thirds being in the affirmative. The gentleman from California. No. Gentleman from California. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I demand the yeas and nays. The yeas and nays are requested. All those in favor of taking this vote by the yeas and nays will rise and remain standing until counted. Sufficient number having risen, the yeas and nays are ordered. Pursuant to Clause 8 of Rule 20, further proceedings on this question will be postponed. For what purpose does the gentleman from Kentucky seek recognition? Mr. Speaker, I move to suspend the rules and pass the bill H.R. 2943. The clerk will report the title of the bill. H.R. 2943, a bill to extend the program of block grants to states for temporary assistance for needy families and related programs through December 31, 2011. 
Pursuant to the rule, the gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Davis, and the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Doggett, each will control 20 minutes. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Kentucky. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I ask unanimous consent that all members have five legislative days in which to revise and extend their remarks and to include extraneous material on the subject of the bill under consideration. Without objection. Mr. Speaker, I yield myself such time as I may consume. The gentleman is recognized. Thank you. I rise today in support of H.R. 2943, legislation to temporarily extend the authorization of temporary assistance for needy families and related programs. Since it replaced the New Deal era welfare program in 1996, TANF has been successful at cutting welfare dependence by 57 percent through the end of last year. Even more importantly, by promoting work among single parents who are the most common welfare recipients, it helps significantly reduce child poverty in female-headed families over time. Even at today's elevated unemployment rates, TANF continues to promote more work and earnings and less poverty. But despite this general progress, TANF can and should be strengthened to do more especially to help more low-income families work and support themselves in the years ahead. <clears throat> Unfortunately, too many parents are exempted from work requirements today for a variety of reasons. We learned in a recent hearing held by the Ways and Means Subcommittee on Human Resources, which I'm privileged to chair. But given the current administration's support for only a straight one-year extension of current law, which is a view shared uh, by the other body, there are limited prospects for making needed changes to TANF before the program expires at the end of this month. That's the reason for the short-term extension before us today. This three-month extension will provide an opportunity for Congress, including the Joint Select Committee on Deficit Reduction, to review TANF alongside other entitlement programs this fall. <coughs> Important questions need to be asked, including what's the, pro the proper funding level for these programs and how can they best be focused on engaging more low-income parents in work and other productive activities so more can support themselves in the long run. Another thing this additional time will let us do is to take action to close what some call the strip club loophole. This refers to an outright abuse of taxpayer trust permitted under current law when adults on welfare spend taxpayer funds on liquor, gambling, tattoos, or even visits to strip clubs. As recent exposés have revealed, too many welfare recipients access taxpayer funds at cash machines, in casinos, liquor stores, strip clubs, and even on cruise ships. Some states have already taken action to close this loophole by blocking access to welfare EBT cards at such establishments. There's bipartisan legislation to require all states to do that, and doing so is something of particular interest to our colleague, Senator Coburn. I share his commitment to getting this done this fall and urge all my colleagues to support action that we'll take to close this loophole. <coughs> this legislation before us is designed to provide time for a closer review of and action on these sorts of issues. Importantly, it does not add to our deficit since it simply continues current TANF funding for three months. I note that TANF is a fixed block grant, which is not adjusted for inflation. I wish we were debating legislation today that extended and actually improved TANF programs so that they work better, but given the impediments before us, the bill before the House today offers the best chance that we'll be able to do that in the near future, and I urge all my colleagues to support it. I reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman reserves. The gentleman from Texas. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I yield myself five minutes. Gentlemen, recognized for five minutes. Mr. Speaker, this is a bipartisan bill which I fully support, but it is important to understand what this bill does and what it does not do. It is important to understand upon which provisions we agree and which ones we accept as only being better than the alternative of allowing this important law and all those who count on it to expire next week. Last week, the Census Bureau reported that more Americans were poor in 2010 than at any time on record. Regrettably, my home state of Texas was leading the way with one of the highest poverty rates anywhere in America. The Texas Center for Public Policy Priorities, a nonpartisan group, recently reported that, quote, the heart of the American dream is at risk in Texas. For the first time in generations, there are more people falling out of the middle class than joining its ranks. And what a struggle it is for those families trying to hold on. In a neighborhood near downtown San Antonio, Andrew Ramos and his wife Nina are struggling just to keep food on the table for themselves and their two-year-old daughter. Andrew lost his job and Nina works on at a local pizza parlor where she makes about $200 a week. There are so many families just like the Ramos family. 
almost one in five in poverty in Bear County. As John Turner at the Capital Area Food Bank concludes, hunger is a result of lack of income and of a livable wage. It affects too many of our neighbors, he says, under the current Texas economic model. The demands on our food banks, which serve as effective public-private partnerships, are immense. The Capital Area Food Bank this year is delivering 50% more food to poor people than it did three years ago. But I don't really hear anyone facing up to this harsh reality. Not our governor in Texas, not the president of the United States, and certainly not the leadership here in the House. In fact, the administration has shown little interest and almost no guidance in reforming this legislation. Rather than respond to rising deprivation and declining opportunity, this legislation continues for another three months, the Temporary Assistance for Needy Families Act. This is a program that today provides direct assistance to only one in every five children living in America that are in poverty. That's the lowest level of poor children receiving direct assistance since 1965. And of course, in Texas, it's much worse. Only one in every 20 poor children receive direct assistance from TANF. The bill before us also does not address a problem agreed to originally when the Welfare Reform Act was enacted, a bill that I voted for, uh, that would address the particular needs of high poverty states like Texas and many in the South with what are called TANF supplemental grants really a misnomer because they're not a supplement, they're essential to the work of states that have higher poverty rates. Ever since that time of the Welfare Reform Act, Texas and those states have depended on supplemental TANF. It is not included in today's legislation and that means that Texas uh, will lose about $50 million uh, every year that it relies on to work with child care, with preventing pregnancy, with other issues like school dropouts uh, that it relies on these funds today. Allowing these grants to expire uh, is in sharp contrast to what happened in 2001 when Governor Rick Perry wrote then leader or whip Tom DeLay urging the extension of TANF supplemental grants saying quote these grants have played an important role in helping hard-working men and women in Texas achieve independence from public assistance. Congress designed the supplemental grants to address the critical program needs of the states. Uh, those were words of Governor Rick Perry, who is silent on this matter today about how we enable more Texans to move from welfare to work. Mr. Speaker, we cannot allow the funding for TANF to expire next week. And so I join wholeheartedly with this renewal legislation. But we also need to move past doing the very least that we can do and start responding to the mounting challenges that families, not just in Texas, but across our country face. TANF has not been adequately responsive to the increased level of need during these bad economic times. Mr. Speaker, I yield myself one more minute. Gentlemen, uh, recognized for one minute. I think also of the words of Claudia Harrington, who works at El Buen Samaritano, dealing largely with Latino families. She writes, this is not the American <clears throat> dream I believe in. This is not the American dream my father believed in when he immigrated from Cuba here in the 1960s. I know our country is better than that, regardless of political affiliation. And I know that investment in our people and their ability to earn a decent living is a worthwhile policy. We need a policy that is more safety net than whole. And I hope eventually we can work together to achieve that. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Reserve. Kentucky. My I mean, a gentleman my reserves. The gentleman reserves. The gentleman from Kentucky. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the gentleman's suggestion that this legislation should be amended to revive the TANF Supplemental Grants Program. TANF Supplemental Grants expired in June 2011 in accordance with legislation Democrats crafted last year that President Obama signed into law. These payments have now expired and are not payable under current law. Extending them would mean spending more money to revive the program, which is beyond the scope of what we're doing today in maintaining only current TANF programs. Since TANF supplemental grants were first paid, about $4 billion in extra TANF funds have been paid out only to a minority of states. 
At some point, we have to ask when such supplemental spending should come to an end. The last Congress, which again was led by Democratic majorities, said the end should come this past June. I respect that judgment. The committee is obviously aware of Mr. Doggett's bill to extend these payments yet again, but we don't know how we would, he would pay for that since the bill he introduced includes no pay for. That would mean increasing our current historic deficits even more. All states received a share of $5 billion in special welfare funds in the 2009 stimulus bill. That was on top of almost $17 billion in TANF block grant payments all states receive each year, including those that previously collected supplemental grants. The states that collected supplemental grants received about $913 million of that $5 billion in one-time funds, or the equivalent of almost three years of supplemental grant payments. <coughs> I appreciate the gentleman's argument for extending these payments by reviving the now-ended supplemental grants program. The legislation before us does not do that since it simply extends current law programs. But I know he and I will continue to have fruitful discussions and work together about this and other TANF funding and related issues. And I appreciate his continued input and uh, uh, effort. And with that, I reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman reserves. The gentleman from Texas. Mr. Speaker, I would yield myself 15 seconds to say that under gentleman Democratic Jack leadership, we extended the supplemental TANF program that Governor Rick Perry was so proud about in 2001. We extended it four times. The only reason that it existed in the spring of this year was because of our extensions. It should be extended once again, and I hope Gentleman's in the process we can do that. I would yield two minutes to the gentleman from New York, Mr. Rangel. Thank you, Mr. Doggett. The gen Without objection, the gentleman is recognized for two minutes. I uh, come to the floor in this non-controversial bill and as a proud member of the Ways and Means Committee to show the Congress and the country that we uh, are concerned more about than just taxes. I want to thank uh, Mr. Davis for his leadership uh, in this area and especially my friend Mr. Doggett who have stuck uh, with the committee uh, in trying to make certain that we improve the life of those people who are so vulnerable in our society. Uh, to think that one out of five children in America, the United States of America, is living in poverty, uh, to recognize that 46 million people, uh, family four makes uh, less than $22,000, is certainly not what has inspired so many people to get out of poverty and move into the middle class, which is the heart of America and the heart of our economy. Uh, this bill does just that. It comes to us to look, to give authority to the states, to see what works, to make certain that people don't have to stay on welfare, that they can have a goal in being uh, fully employed. And it takes away the image that we have as a country that we applaud people who are being executed, that we applaud those people that don't have health insurance. No, America is more than that, and during these hard times, we have to make certain that we do, as the members of this committee, a classic example is Mr. Doggett, is Mr. Davis, uh, both on a hard working committee but care enough about the people in our country to show that this is bipartisan and the people that are poor, the people that are in need, the people that are without homes and without hope are not Democrats, they're not Republicans, they are people in our country and we have an obligation to show that there is a need for government, there is a need uh, for caring and I am proud to be a member of this committee and a member of this Congress to show that's what our country is all about. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman uh, from Kentucky. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to inquire if the uh, gentleman is prepared to close. I believe I have an additional speaker. Uh, the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Levin, uh, for such time as you may uh, The gentleman from Kentucky has got the time. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I will reserve. Uh, gentleman reserves. Okay, gentleman from Texas. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I would yield two minutes to the gentleman from Washington State, uh, former chair of this subcommittee, uh, Mr. McDermott. Gentleman's recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, <clears throat> I. Uh, I want to say just a few words about this. Obviously, I support the extension of the TANF, but I think that 
there is a real need, and we've been extending it one year at a time, one year at a time, one year at a time for some time. There really is a need to relook at the whole concept of what this, well, this safety net really needs to be. We wiped out welfare as we know it, as was the phrase in 1996, at a time when the economy in this country was going straight up. Anybody could find a job if they looked for one. And it was very clear that there was efforts in that bill to push people off the rolls and out into the work market. Now, it was possible to do that. Today, however, you have a situation where there are four people looking for every job that's out there. You have many middle-class families who have exhausted 99 weeks of unemployment and have nothing in this country except food stamps. Now, it sort of depends on whether or not we're going to have a middle class in this country when we have a downturn like this and we decide whether we're going to help the middle class make it. We've got foreclosures that won't quit and we've had no proposals out of the House to do anything about foreclosure prevention. So you have middle class people who've lost their job, their unemployment is gone, they are now having their house foreclosed and they look to their government for a safety net and find nothing but food stamps. And in my belief, there is a time when we should help the middle class in this country be able to go through what may be another year or two. We're not quite sure how long it'll be, but it should not be that there is no program available to help middle class people who have fallen on very difficult times. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from Kentucky. Mr. Speaker, I continue to reserve. The gentleman reserves. The gentleman from Texas. Mr. Speaker, I'm prepared to close. Ms. The gentleman's recognized. Mr. Speaker, I yield myself such time as I may consume. Mr. Speaker, uh, the House should approve this important bipartisan legislation today. To fail to approve this modest extension uh, would cause even more people uh, to suffer with the expiration of these programs next week. But, Mr. Speaker, uh, it may not be in vogue to discuss the problems of poor people in America today, but we need to hear more about it in this House. We need to hear more about it in Washington, D.C. Uh, certainly, we want to support and encourage the middle class in America. Very, very important. But we need to create more opportunity to broaden that middle class for the many people who struggle and hope that lives will be better for their children and that they will face less obstacle than their parents have faced, we need to provide that temporary assistance to needy families. The current program leaves out too many and forgets too many of those families in their struggle. The omission of what is included as supplemental TANF that we renewed four times in the last two Congresses it not being renewed here means that in Texas and so many high poverty states, we will not have the support that Governor Rick Perry once called for. We will have a broadened gap and lack of services. Many of the dollars that we've received in that program of Texas have gone into child protective services to protect abused and neglected children. They will no longer have that assistance. I hope in the course of the legislative process, of the renewal of this legislation, we might eventually get that into the bill. Today, we see so many uh, who are losing the opportunity to share in the American dream. We have an opportunity to continue at least a minimal level of support to them. We should do that, but we should commit ourselves to doing even more. And I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Kentucky. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. H.R. 2943 simply is a short-term continuation of welfare-to-work programs that have successfully cut welfare dependence and promoted work. I urge my colleagues to support this legislation and to work with us to design a long-term reauthorization bill that fixes flaws in the system, fixes broken processes, and allows agencies to communicate in a more holistic uh, way as we address this to eliminate uh, waste of taxpayer dollars and uh, des ultimately to design a long-term reauthorization bill that further promotes work and independence from welfare. With that, I yield back the balance of my time. Jim yields back. The question is...
the House suspend the rules and pass H.R. 2943. Those in favor say aye. Those opposed, no. In the opinion of the chair, two-thirds being in the affirmative, the rules are suspended, the bill is passed, and without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid on the table. For, the, for what purpose does the gentleman from Kentucky seek recognition? Uh, Mr. Speaker, I move to suspend the rules and pass the bill H.R. 2883. The clerk. The gentleman call up the bill as amended? Yes, Mr. Speaker. The clerk will report. Union calendar number 138, H.R. 2883, a bill to amend Part B of Title IV of the Social Security Act to extend the Child and Family Services Program through the fiscal year 2016 and for other purposes. Pursuant to the rule, the gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Davis, and the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Doggett, each will control 20 minutes. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Kentucky. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I ask unanimous consent that all members have five legislative days in which to revise and extend their remarks and to include extraneous material on the subject of the bill under consideration. Without objection. Mr. Speaker, I yield myself such time as I may consume. Gentlemen, recognize. Thank you. I rise today in support of H.R. 2883, the Child and Family Services Improvement and Innovation Act, a bill that continues a tradition of bipartisanship in crafting child welfare legislation. The bill we're considering today reauthorizes two important child welfare programs incorporating a series of improvements developed during hearings held by the Ways and Means Subcommittee on Human Resources over the past few months. In addition to continuing and making improvements to two major child welfare programs, this bill also renews authority for the Secretary of Health and Human Services to approve child welfare waivers during the next three years. Past waivers have allowed states to test new and better ways of helping children at risk of abuse and neglect. <clears throat> Earlier this year, the House unanimously passed legislation renewing this authority, but the Senate has not followed suit. This bill, which our colleagues in the Senate also support, and which was favorably reported by the Senate Finance Committee yesterday, will allow innovation to continue and may yield information to improve child welfare programs in the future. The bill will also establish a process to create needed data standards in child welfare programs. This language is a first step towards improving collaboration between social service programs. <clears throat> We've often heard in hearings that states and programs within states have difficulty coordinating services because of difficulty sharing data and that this lack of coordination increases cost and decreases effectiveness. This bill directs the Secretary of HHS to work with the states to establish national data standards so that all state child welfare programs are speaking the same language. To show the wide support for this bill, Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent to insert letters of support into the record from the following organizations. National Conference of State Legislatures, the American Public Human Services Association, the Conference of Chief Justices and the Conference of State Court Administrators, the American Institute of CPAs, the American Humane Association, the North American Council of Adoptable Children, Voice for Adoption, the Association on Indian Affairs, the National Indian Child Welfare Association, Youth Villages, First Focus Campaign for Children, Zero to Three, the National Center for Infants, Toddlers and Families, the National Foster Care Coalition, the Child Welfare League of America, the Children's Defense Fund, the Center for the Study of Social Policy, and Public Children's Services Association of Ohio. And so ordered. I also want to thank the ranking member of the Human Resources Subcommittee, Mr. Doggett of Texas, for working with me on this legislation and for his efforts to improve how we serve children and families across the country. Finally, I want to note that this legislation does not add to the deficit since it simply extends current funding levels of the programs that are extended. I urge all my colleagues to support this legislation and reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman reserves. The gentleman from Texas. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, I yield myself five minutes. Gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Mr. Speaker, the chairman, uh, Mr. Davis, is correct. We have worked on this together. We have participated in hearings and learned together and cooperated on this very important subject to which we may bring di differing perspectives but a common goal of wanting to respond to the needs of America's most vulnerable children. I uh, 
uh, believe that uh, this bipartisan legislation that I do fully support uh, is important, however, in our discussion to understand what we support and where we have differences and to understand what this legislation accomplishes and what it fails to accomplish. Uh, it's certainly preferable to allowing two very important laws to expire next week. Each year, over 700,000 children here in America become victims of abuse and neglect perpetrated by the very people who are supposed to love and care for them. I think to most Americans, as to my wife uh, Libby and I, when we're back home in Texas and surrounded by Clara and Zayla and Ella, our three granddaughters, it's just almost incomprehensible that a parent or grandparent could cause harm to a member of their own family. Yet that is the reality that too many of our children face. One expert came to our committee during the hearing and suggested that once every six hours, every day, a child dies in America as a result of abuse. I agree that both the Child Welfare Services and the Promoting Safe and Stable Families laws should be renewed for another five years. I disagree that these programs should be continued at their current baseline funding levels since with need growing and funding limited, too many of our most vulnerable children cannot access the services that they so desperately need. These are the children whose neglect not only produces problems for them, but will produce more problems for all of American society in the future. They are the children we should be helping today so that we are not incarcerating them after they have done harm to someone tomorrow. Less than half of the children in foster care in America today receive federal assistance to help with the room and board. And today, 40% of children who are found to be victims of abuse and neglect they don't receive any follow-up or intervention at all. That is a very big gap that will likely only grow over the course of the next five years with the legislation that we are renewing. In my home state of Texas, the Promoting Safe and Stable Families Act accounts for a very significant source of funding to help our youngest Texans. According to one of our witnesses in committee, Dr. Jane Burstein of the Center for Public Policy Priorities in Austin, Funding from this program accounts for two of every three dollars supporting child abuse and neglect prevention uh, last year. In San Antonio, for example, these programs provide important resources to help vulnerable families throughout the, th through the use of, by it of the Bear County Child Welfare Board. This bill also grants uh, states a support for parental substance abuse programs. My friend Darlene Byrne, a district judge in Austin, Texas, uh, who helped establish the Family Treatment Drug Court that was partially funded by dollars from this act that we're renewing, writes, new babies are not drug positive. Moms and couples reunify with their family, and workers who receive their GEDs are high school diplomas and find employment. Those are the people that this program helps. In short, she says, this program has contributing, to, contributed to transforming lives and helped to stop the cycle of drug abuse, poverty, and violence in Texas. It is important both to those who benefit directly and to all of us who have a stake in having folks participate to the full extent of their God-given potential and not pose dangers to the rest of our society. Today's legislation also includes, as Mr. Davis indicated, some modest policy changes that strengthen the state's ability to respond to at-risk children. Uh, the, Mr. Speaker, the bill, I believe, however, leaves too many problems unresolved. I think, though, in this current climate, that renewal of the legislation as it's proposed is the best that we can do for our at-risk children. This bill reauthorizes help to at least some children who become victims of maltreatment and provides family support activities to some vulnerable families and promotes adoption services for those children who cannot safely return to their biological parents. I urge my colleagues to support this legislation and I reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman reserves, the gentleman from Kentucky. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I continue to reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman reserves, uh, gentleman from Texas. 
Mr. Speaker, uh, at this time I yield to the former chair of this subcommittee on human resources, the gentleman from Washington, Mr. McDermott, four minutes. The gentleman is recognized for four minutes. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, I rise in strong, strong support of this bill to renew the nation's child welfare programs. I'm glad to see it's happening as it has in the past by unanimous consent. And it's important not just to keep these programs funded and renewed with more than one in five children in the country living in poverty. And with so many odds stacked against foster kids, we need to do more. We need to make progress. That's why I'm so supportive of this bill, because it is not just an extension of the program. It has some important and targeted innovations. Some states, especially my home state of Washington, which has some truly new ideas about how they can do more to prevent foster children, children putting into foster care, even in tough times. One of the real innovations of this bill is to give states waivers for some governmental funding restrictions so that they can test these innovative interventions in their child welfare programs. If the state can maintain their current quality and the innovations they want to try meet solid criteria, the federal government should be a partner in making real progress. That's what these new waivers do. Washington State is one of the leaders in innovating child welfare policy. Then they have some things they've been eager to try out. Right now, the law doesn't allow this kind of experimentation, but this bill gives states a way to begin. Washington State is not alone. There will be there's room for 10 states to have these kinds of programs. There are some states already ready to make these moves. Now, the Department of Health and Human Services allowed this kind of thing in the past, but it was allowed to lapse, and this is really an extension of something we've had before. HHS was allowed to give out a number of waivers in the past, and some progress was made in a number of states. This bill restores that limited waiver authority and sets out criteria to keep the integrity and level of effort they need to have. We need to allow these states to do it. In addition to extending the program and making more room for innovation, the bill does something else that's really important. In 2008, we passed the Fostering Connections and Increasing Adoptions Law. This Fostering Connections Law did a lot of good in helping foster kids have a better chance of truly making it in the country. Among other things, it addressed the health concerns of foster children who move from home to home and from health care setting to health care setting, and it required states to develop health coordination plans for these kids so that they had some continuity of care. These plans had to include oversight of prescription medications, including psychotropic drugs. As a psychiatrist who's worked with children in child welfare and the juvenile justice system, I'm very concerned about the use of psych psychotropic drugs with children. For, I've been, for a long time it's bothered me. And in the fostering care population, it is a particularly vulnerable group because of this question of continuity of care. You want somebody to be monitoring what's happening as they move from home to home to home. We need to do more. We need to get a clearer picture of what's happening with these kinds of medications in the foster kids, and we need to make sure they're being used properly and not overly prescribed. One of the parts about this whole law that's crazy is that when a kid gets to 18, they could be on a medication. When they hit 18, they're done. Their Medicaid ends. They have no continuity of the drugs. They go off cold turkey. So there's some real questions that we need to answer here. This bill makes the 2008 requirements takes them another step forward, and it requires states to adopt protocols for using and monitoring psychotropic medications among foster children. Mr. Speaker, I speak strongly in favor of the bill and urge my colleagues to say yay. Gentleman's time has expired. Gentleman from Kentucky. I uh, continue to reserve, Mr. Speaker. Gentleman from Kentucky reserves. Gentleman thank, from Texas. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, one of the leaders on this subject of foster children who came and testified to our committee uh, based on her long experience working in the state of California in the assembly on this subject is Ms. Bass, our colleague uh, from California, and I would yield her two minutes at this time. 
Gentlelady is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I rise today in strong support of H.R. 2883, the Child and Family Services Improvement and Innovation Act. As co-chair of the Bipartisan Congressional Caucus on Foster Care, I'm proud to stand with my colleagues on both sides of the aisle in support of this important legislation. Youth in the child welfare system fight for what so many of us take for granted, a family. In California, my home state, the nation's largest foster care system, on any given year as many as 100,000 children can be placed in temporary out-of-home care. Foster parents and relatives are the frontline caregivers for children when their parents are unable to care for them. A pool of dedicated, loving foster parents is critical for our nation's foster youth as they wait to be reunited with their parents or achieve permanency with a relative caregiver or adoptive family. However, there is a significant shortage of foster parents. In May, I introduced legislation calling for a study to find out how to best recruit and retain foster parents. This was included in the original House bill reauthorizing Title IV-B child welfare programs introduced in August. I'm pleased that the modified bill before us today includes a provision that encourages states to develop and implement a plan to improve the recruitment and retention of high-quality foster family homes. H.R. 2883 builds on some of the best practices that were shared with me as I've traveled California hearing from youth, child welfare workers, and parents. The bill also appropriately addresses challenges facing the child welfare system by requiring states to address emotional trauma in foster children and to adopt protocols for using and monitoring psychotropic medic medications. I'm very pleased with the comments of my colleague, Mr. McDermott, uh, who talked about the use of psychotropics. And I would just add that in too many cases, children are prescribed multiple medications. And in talking with a number of youth up and down the state of California, one of the things that many youth said to me was, can you please help me get off the medication? I'd like to thank Ways and Means Chair and Ranking Member Camp and Levin and Human Resources Subcommittee Chair Davis and Ranking Member Doggett for their unwavering commitment to our most vulnerable youth. I yield back the balance of my time. General's ladies, time has expired. A gentleman from Kentucky. Uh, Mr. Sp Mr. Speaker, I continue to reserve. Gentleman from Kentucky reserves. Gentleman from Texas. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, at this time I'd like to recognize our colleague from Rhode Island for two minutes. He's been uh, very active in uh, a Foster Care Financial Security Act. Uh, Mr. Langevin for two minutes. Gentleman's recognized for two minutes. Without objection. I, I thank the gentleman for yielding. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, I rise in strong support of the Child and Fina Family Services Improvement Act and Innovation uh, Act. This bill includes a provision from the Foster Youth Financial Security Act that I introduced with my colleague, Mr. Stark, to address disturbingly high rates of identity theft among foster youth. I, along with many others, was absolutely outraged to find that foster children are disproportionately victims of identity theft since their personal information passes through so many hands. Now, Mr. Speaker, as, as I saw firsthand when my parents welcomed foster youth uh, into our home over many years, uh, they already faced tremendous obstacles without the increased threat of having their identity taken and their credit ruined, which prevents them from uh, finding a place to live, accessing credit on their own, or obtaining other basic needs. This bill would ensure that each foster youth over 16 years of age uh, receives free credit checks before leaving the system and assistance uh, clearing any accuracies that may have uh, come to light. Reports have shown that if done effectively, the cost is minimal. So I just want to thank, uh, Mr. Speaker, the, the committee for their interest in this issue and the many advocates who have championed this cause. This is only a, a, the first step in providing foster youth with the tools that they need uh, and deserve to succeed. And I look forward to our continued work together uh, on this issue. As I pointed out, uh, so many times uh, our, the, the kids in foster care uh, already face significant challenges uh, of their own, of a personal nature. Uh, it is a shame if they are found that uh, their identity is stolen and they're further victimized. Uh, this bill would identify problems early on, clear up the inaccuracies so that they can start their adult life with a fresh 
uh, start with their credit intact. And I just thank the, uh, uh, both gentlemen, the chair and the ranking member, for their outstanding support of this, uh, this provision. And I yield back the, the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Kentucky. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I continue to reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman reserves. Gentleman from Texas. Mr. Speaker, I would yield myself such time as I might consume uh, to close on this legislation. Gentlemen's recognized. Mr. Speaker, some in this House have suggested earlier in the year that the programs embodied in this legislation and everything else that opens opportunities uh, through government support uh, from Pell Grants to Title I funding for education to the school lunch program to Head Start, that uh, all of these are welfare and should be cut. Fortunately, that approach is not being taken here today. We are reauthorizing in a bipartisan way uh, these two very important programs that would expire next year, Ex expire next week, actually, as well as next year. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, however, it should be noted that much like somebody might be flatlined, that we are flat funding the renewal of these programs meaning that in five years we are authorizing the same amount of money uh, for these programs if it can be appropriated that existed last year. That means that there are many needs in our country that will not be fully addressed uh, in uh, this legislation. It means that last year if less than half of those in foster care received support for food and board, uh, they will be in the same situation over the course of this legislation. It means that the 40 percent of children uh, who are subject to abuse and neglect are unlikely to be able to access services as they were last year. But renewing this legislation remains, despite those deficiencies, an important accomplishment uh, in the current political environment. And as Mr. Davis has noted and a number of our other speakers, we have, also, we have made some modest improvements. Another of those not touched on yet uh, is our work in this legislation to ensure that children in foster care can stay in the schools that they started in, uh, even though they may be moved between families. That's a, an important part of adding a little certainty to the life of a child who's been abused or neglected and finds themselves with a great deal of uncertainty. It is for the improvements in this act and the recognition of what harm would be done if this act were not uh, adopted here in a bipartisan way uh, that so many child advocacy groups have joined in supporting it. The Child Welfare League of America, First Focus, Zero to Three, as well as groups of those organizations that are involved in administering some of these funds, the National Conference of State Legislatures, the American Public Human Services Association, and the Conference of State Court Administrators. I believe this legislation is important. It's important to get it adopted promptly. I hope the Senate will respond to our bipartisan approval today, uh, as Mr. Davis has suggested they've already begun to do in the committee process and move forward to see it fully adopted uh, by next week. I urge all of my colleagues to join in supporting this legislation, and I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from Kentucky. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm grateful to my friend from Texas, Mr. Doggett, uh, for working with me to bring this measure to the floor today and thank him and thank both the uh, minority and majority staffs for their hard work on this effort. Uh, H.R. 2883 is a bipartisan, bicameral, no-cost effort to extend and make modest adjustments to programs designed to help ensure the safety and well-being of children at risk of abuse and neglect. We need to do all we can to ensure more children remain safely in their homes, and this bill will help to do so. Also, I ask unanimous consent to have an exchange of letters entered into the record. The quit. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. With that, I yield back the balance of my time. The question is, would the House suspend the rules and pass H.R. 2883 as amended? Those in favor say aye. Those opposed, no. In the opinion of the chair, two-thirds being in the Mr. affirmative, Speaker. the rules are... Gentleman from Kentucky. Uh, on that, I ask for a recorded vote. Gentleman asked for the yeas and nays. Yes. The yeas and nays are requested. All those in favor of taking this vote by the yeas and nays will rise and remain standing until counted. A sufficient number having risen, the yeas and nays are ordered pursuant to Clause 8 of Rule 20. 
further proceedings on this question will be postponed. The clerk will report the resolution. What purpose does the gentleman from Georgia rise? Mr. Speaker, by direction of the Committee on Rules, I call up House Resolution 305 and ask for its immediate consideration. The clerk will report the resolution. House Calendar Number 73, House Resolution 405. Resolved that upon adoption of this resolution, it shall be in order to take from the Speaker's table the bill H.R. 2608 to provide for an additional temporary extension of programs under the Small Business Act and the Small Business Investment Act of 1958 and for other purposes, with a Senate amendment thereto, and to consider in the House without intervention of any point of order a motion offered by the Chair of the Committee on Appropriations or his designee that the House concur in the Senate amendment with the amendment printed in the report of the Committee on Rules accompanying this resolution. The Senate amendment and the motion shall be considered as read. The motion shall be debatable for one hour, equally divided and controlled by the chair and ranking minority member of the Committee on Appropriations. The previous question shall be considered as ordered on the motion to its adoption without intervening motion. Section 2, House Resolution 399 is laid on the table. The gentleman from Georgia is recognized for one hour. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, for the purpose of debate only, I'd like to yield the customary 30 minutes to the gentlelady from New York, uh, Ms. Slaughter, uh, pending which I yield myself such time as I may consume. Gentlemen's recognized. They, and Mr. Speaker, during consideration of this resolution, uh, all time is yielded for the purpose of debate only, and I ask unanimous consent that all members have five legislative days to revise and extend their Without review. objection. Mr. Speaker, House Resolution 305 provides for a closed rule for the consideration of H.R. 2608. It's a, it's a temporary continuing resolution that will fund the operations of the United States government through November 18th of this year. It's important to note that the funding levels in this CR are the very same uh, fiscally responsible levels that this Congress and President Barack Obama approved in the Budget Control Act just one month ago. This is not a departure from our path of restoring fiscal sanity, Mr. Speaker. We're committed uh, to continuing on that path, but unfortunately, the actions of the other body leave us no choice but to consider this continuing resolution today. I take no pride, Mr. Speaker, in sharing with you. Actually, that's not true. That's not true at all. I take great pride in sharing with you what the House has done over the last six months, seven months, eight months, but I take no pride at all in pointing out what has not happened on the other end of this Capitol to do the work that, we need do, that needs to be done. Constitutionally, Mr. Speaker, you know we're required to fund the operations of the government. June 2nd of this year, the House passed the Homeland Security Appropriations Bill. To date, the Senate has not. On June 14th of this year, the House passed the Military Construction and Veterans Affairs Bill. This is the one bill that our friends in the Senate have passed as well. June 16th, the House passed the Agriculture Appropriations Bill. To date, the Senate has taken no action at all. July 15th, the House passed the Energy and Water Appropriations Bill. To date, the Senate has not. July 22nd, the House passes the Legislative Branch Appropriations Bill. To date, the Senate has not. Mr. Speaker, I did not 
run for Congress last November. I did not show up here as a freshman to continue business as usual, passing continuing resolution after continuing resolution after continuing resolution. And I know my friends on both sides of the aisle believe that's a process that has long since uh, exceeded its usefulness. And so I'm so proud that as a body, we have begun to pass those appropriations bills one by one by one. And what have we gotten because of that, Mr. Speaker? We've gotten oversight. We've had the opportunity to discuss line by line by line what are our priorities as a House. Now, those priorities differ from time to time between my friends on the Democratic side of the aisle, my friends on the Republican side of the aisle. But we have an opportunity at least to discuss those priorities. When the other body fails to pass the appropriations bills, what choices do we have left? What choices are available to me as a new freshman member of the, of the House? I could choose to abdicate responsibility. I could choose to, to say, no, no, you, we're just going to wait. And if the Senate fails to act, then, uh, then, then so be it. And, and let, the, let the government shut down and, and, and let the chips fall where they may. I, that's not the kind of operation I want to run. That's not why I came to the United States Congress. I came to the United States Congress because this is the people's house. This is where thoughtful discussion of the people's priorities takes place. What brings me to the floor today, Mr. Speaker, is to consider this continuing resolution that for just really one and a half short months, through November 18th, will extend the operations of the government so that we can continue that thoughtful discussion uh, that I know so many of the members here uh, came for. And, and with that, uh, I urge my colleagues to uh, thoughtfully consider uh, this rule today, thoughtfully consider the underlying uh, bill, and I reserve the balance of my time. Gentlemen reserved, the gentlelady from New York. Mr. Speaker, I thank my colleague for yielding me the customary 30 minutes and yield myself such time as I may consume. The gentlelady is recognized. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we're here today because our colleagues in the Republican majority have failed. They fail the most basic responsibility of this institution, as my colleague has mentioned, to pass regular and routine bills to keep the government's doors open, to keep retirement checks in the mail, and vital government services available to the American people. In a few days, the fiscal year will end, and without a stopgap measure, funding for essential government services will run out. Despite nine months of claims from the Republican majority that things have changed, and despite a pledge to America that promised a different Washington, and despite endless calls for a regular appropriations process, not a single appropriations bill has been enacted for the upcoming fiscal year, which begins October 1. Throughout this failed process, the majority has blamed everyone but themselves. They've pointed fingers at President Obama, complained about our colleagues in the Senate, blamed Washington's status quo that they say they can't control. Throughout the process, the one group of people they won't lay responsibility with is themselves. After nine months, with not a single bill successfully making its way through Congress, finger pointing rings hollow. Not only has no appropriations bill been enacted, but half of the necessary appropriations bills haven't even been brought to the floor for a vote. The majority controls the body and has used the power to pursue sideshow legislation and dangerous games of default but they can't schedule a vote for the most fundamental pieces of legislation that we consider every year. As I stand here today to vote on a billion dollar band-aid that will allow us to scrape by until November, the hope is that by November the majority will be able to do the job they failed to do all year. Growing up, every child hopes for such a homework extension. By the time we're elected to Congress, however, we know that our work must be handed in on time. Sadly, today's legislation isn't even the biggest failure that we're facing in the House. If press reports are accurate, we may be heading for an even bigger failure in November. In recent days, reports have surfaced that the majority plans to fund the entire federal government with one massive trillion-dollar omnibus bill. omnibus bill. This bill would explicitly break a promise that the Republican majority made to the American people. In the Pledge to America, the leadership included a goal entitled, quote, advance legislative issues one at a time, end quote. In the document, they explain, quote, we will end the practice of packaging unpopular bills with must-pass legislation to circumvent the will of the American people. Instead, we will advance major legislation one issue at a time, end quote. During a speech at the American Enterprise Institute in 2010, 
Speaker Boehner affirmed the need to consider appropriations legislation one bill at a time, saying he wanted to do away with the concept of comprehensive spending bills. On the eve of assuming the majority in the House, Speaker Boehner elaborated, saying, I do not believe that having 2,000-page bills on the House floor serves anyone's best interest, not the House, not the members, and not the American people, end quote. But if press reports are correct, a 2,000-page bill or more is what we will get. Let's be clear, the prospect of omnibus funding is happening for two simple reasons. First, the colleagues on the other side will not work in a bipartisan manner. There are no re Democrat fingerprints on any bills that come to the floor and to make the compromise necessary to reach consensus. They continue to pass legislation filled with special interest favors and ideological pursuits that the American people never ask for and don't want. As a result, the legislation is built to fail, and fail it does over and over again. Secondly, instead of doing the tough, unglamorous work of the House, we have spent most of the time on ideological quests and political games. Instead of fulfilling the pledge to uphold the Constitution, the majority has worked to fulfill campaign pledges to Grover Norquist and the far right. Instead of creating jobs, our colleagues on the other side spent months on end pushing a partisan agenda that has covered everything from the trivial to the very real dangers of default. Instead of funding the Department of Energy, the majority has tried to micromanage our light bulbs. Instead of funding the nation's school, they tried to eliminate Big Bird. Instead of funding the EPA, they tried to sell the land surrounding the Grand Canyon to the state-owned mining companies of Russia and South Korea. Instead of funding cancer research conducted by the National Institute of Health, they have tried repeatedly to repeal health care reform. Instead of setting a responsible budget for the next fiscal year, they brought our economy to the brink of default and led to the first ever downgrade of our nation's credit. Even today, our colleagues on the other side are injecting politics into the stopgap CR. Today, we are considering legislation that will only provide disaster relief to hurricane victims if billions of dollars are taken from a successful alternative energy program that has created 39,000 jobs to date and is poised to create 60,000 more. We were told in the Rules Committee that this was money simply lying there. In effect, the, American, the other side of the aisle is telling the American people that Congress will either help rebuild shattered communities or Congress will create new green jobs. But we refuse to do both. This immoral approach reflects a House of Representatives void of responsible leadership from those in charge. Today I'll do the little bit that I can to provide leadership sorely lacking, lacking from those in charge. Mr. Speaker, if we can defeat the previous question, the end of this debate, I will offer an amendment to the rule to ensure that disaster victims get the help they need. My amendment will allow Representative Dingell to offer a motion to strike the unacceptable House language that says all disaster aid must be offset and substitute the bipartisan Senate approach. Since 2004, American taxpayers have spent over $3.4 billion on infrastructure in Afghanistan and even more in Iraq. Not a single one of those $3.4 billion was held hostage or offset by any program in, the, in our budget. But now, as many Americans are struggling to rebuild and get their lives back to normal, the majority refuses to help unless they are allowed to defund a successful program they happen to dislike. Remember, what this says is that the American public is financing the restructure, financing the reconstruction of Afghanistan and Iraq with taxpayer money, but taxpayer money without an offset will not be used to help the American taxpayer. That takes a lot of explaining. And because the majority decided that pursuing a partisan agenda was more important than meeting the basic needs of the country, we face the prospect of a trillion dollar, a thousand page bill to keep the government running because the other side will not stop playing politics and start governing as we are all expected to do. This failure is a disservice to the American people, abdication of our responsibilities as legislators, and a shame to the expectations, responsibilities, and duties of the House. 
The majority rode into Washington vowing to change the ways of the past. But over the last nine months, the American people have witnessed a case study in abandoned responsibilities and misguided priorities. Until the Republican majority begins to govern with responsibility, I fear this Congress will continue to live up to the low regard our nation has for it, which brings shame on us all. I urge my colleagues on the other side to stop serving their political interests. Start doing bipartisan bills. Start serving our country. In closing, I urge my colleagues to vote no on today's rule, the underlying legislation, and I reserve the balance of my time.